Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to start there. I am really excited to bring this message at the tail end of the Love Express series, because as we've gotten done talking about worship, uh, I, I love the fact that you can't touch God without being touched back. It's what Pastor said a couple of weeks ago. It's like, it's like when you play you know, tag and there's no touchbacks because you touch and then they touch you right back. If you touch God, he touches you back. Every single time. And inevitably, when God touches you, he gives you a promise. And so I want to talk to you this morning about promises. The title of the message is Why God Makes Promises. Every time God touches someone, he's making a promise to them. His presence itself is a promise. Why God Makes Promises. And I want you to notice something about the title this morning, and it, it, it's that it doesn't say what promises does God make. It doesn't say God makes promises. It says why. And there's a reason why it's titled that, because you understand that to know what someone does is one level of relationship, but when you understand why they do it, you know them better. See, the scripture says that Israel knew God's acts, but Moses knew God's ways. I don't want to just know what God does. I want to know why he does it. I want to know his heart. What is behind that? And so what I believe is that uh, as you hear why God does this thing, why he does this thing called promises, what it will do is it will motivate you to listen for his promises and to want to live in the midst of them. It's a huge motivator. And so let's go here. We're going to start in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. I I have to set this up just a bit, though. This is Paul, obviously. He's writing to the church of Corinth. And most of 2 Corinthians, you might know, is a defense of Paul's ministry. Paul is refuting uh, what are false teachers, false prophets, false evangelists, false brethren, Judaizers, idol worshipers, all kinds of evil people who have come and attacked the church at Corinth. And what they're doing is they're trying to undergird Paul's ministry, or rather undercut it, not undergird it, undercut it, so that they can defame him and thus take the preeminence among those people. They, in fact, wanted to push Paul out so they could be looked at as the leadership. And so they wanted to bring in a lot of false doctrines. So one of the ways they were doing that was they were saying that Paul was a liar, that Paul didn't keep his word. And if you can't believe Paul's promises, then why would you believe the promises of the God that he teaches about? See, that was what they were doing. And this particular passage hinges upon one particular statement that Paul made. Paul had told the church at Corinth in an earlier letter, he said, if the Lord wills, I want to come by and I want to visit you. Have you ever said if God wills and then weren't able to do it? I mean, I have. Do you have kids? <laughs> Don't ever say it's for sure unless it's for sure. Because, boy, I, my kids will hold me to it. And Paul had said, I'm, I want to come if the Lord wills. Well, he, the Lord didn't will. He was not able to make it there yet. And so what these false teachers were saying was, you see, he lied. He didn't come. And so Paul took that very seriously. Why? Not just to defend himself, but because he was defending not only his character, but he was defending God's character, that God not only keeps promises, but the ones he makes are absolutely sure. So we pick that up here in verse 15. He says, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit, and to pass by a way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning these things, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be, watch this, yes, yes, and no, no. In other words, I say yes now, but then circumstances and feelings change. I get a little fickle, and then I change it to no, no. Paul's saying, no, that's not the way I did it. It didn't work that way. Verse 18, but as God is faithful, your word, or our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. And look at verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Here's what he's saying. We've got to live a life based on promises. And if you don't understand that God's a promise-making God and a promise-keeping God, you're going to be robbed of knowing his goodness. See, God is a promise-making God. He's been making promises ever since the beginning of the Bible. From Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelations 22, from the very first let there be to the very last I'm coming quickly, it's filled with promises. In fact, everything God says is a promise. 
Because when God says it, surely it will happen. So, if God's a promise-making God and we're to live by those promises, here's what I believe. If you understand why he does it, it's gonna motivate you to get what he wants to give. So here are the overarching reasons why God gives promises. Here's the first one. Number one, because promises are the basis for faith. Because promises are the basis for faith. And I mean they are the, they are the undergirding, they are the foundation of any faith you ever have. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. Very common scripture, we hear it a lot, but let's try to hear it with childlike faith first. Now faith is the substance, watch this, of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. This verse is saying that faith is substance and faith is evidence. Well, the, but where does the faith come from? Well, if you cross-reference that over to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So if you don't have first a promise, you can't have faith. And therefore, you can't have the things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. You see, once you get faith, you already have what faith has promised. It just takes a little bit of time and patience to inherit the fullness of it. See? But once you get the promise and faith comes, you already have what God has spoken. My first job um, out of my, I think it was my junior year in high school, I had a, I had a job. Now, this was BC, okay? <laughs> so don't judge me. Don't throw any soup cans or anything. I, I didn't know Jesus. But I, I, worked for, I worked for a mobile home company, and I, I repossessed mobile homes with uh, a team of really bad men. <laughs> they, they were. And I was one of them. And I, we would go with a team of about five, and we would show up at someone's mobile home who'd missed their payment, and we would wait for them to leave. We would take about 30 to 40 minutes, and we would cut the electric, cut the plumbing, put axles underneath the house, cut all the tie downs, rip off all the lattice work, and we would drive off with your house in about 40 minutes. I, know, I cannot receive from this man now. Okay, it was a long time ago. God's not making you get up here and talk about some of the jobs you've done either, okay? <laughs> well, all that was fine and good until we got back to the job site one time, and what we'd realized was not only was there an angry homeowner, but the angry homeowner had put a, a, a bullet hole in the back of one of our truck's windows. So I became immediately motivated to change my career path <laughs> into something where they don't shoot at you. So I asked for a transfer to the other side of the company. Now, the other side of the company was the company that delivered both mobile homes and prefab housing. And so I figured, well, when, they probably don't shoot at you when you're bringing them their house. <laughs> and so I changed, and I started working with the side of the company that actually brought the house. And prefab housing in those days worked this way. Basically, a crew of construction guys waited at the job site, and you would have two or three flatbed trailers show up, piled high with these pallets of materials, and each of the flatbeds had a little crane and they would offload the pallets. And everything, everything that was needed to build the house was on those pallets. And so my first job, we showed up, it was kind of a small house, I guess, two flatbed trailers show up and they offload these pallets. They sit them right there and the trucks drive away. Now here's what I want you to hear. When the trucks drove away, everything about the house was already there. Every single brick, every piece of wood, every bit of siding, every bit of laminate flooring, everything needed, every shingle, everything needed for the house was there. In other words, the substance of the house was already there. The evidence of what was unseen was literally sitting there. All that took was faith and patience to inherit the promise. Tie it back up. It's cute there, isn't it? But listen. You got to get this though. Listen, if those pallets were faith, the trucks that delivered them were a promise. Without the promise, you can't have faith. Hebrews eleven six. if you just go a little bit further, it says without faith, it's impossible to please him, to please God. He that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, here's the question. Do you think God wants you to be able to please him? It is a legitimate question because there are some people that don't believe that. 
Deep in their heart, they think God's a big miser and he's actually kind of angry, so he's really looking for reasons to kind of mess you up. And he throws out these silly commandments to kind of make you trip so he can go see. If God wanted that, he, 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 could, he could do it a lot easier than, <laughs> than that. God, God is for you. God wants you to please him, and what pleases God is faith. How do you get it? You get a promise. If you lack faith, listen, stirring yourself emotionally is not how you get faith. You get faith when you hear a promise from God and you believe it. That's the first reason God gives promises is because they're the basis for faith. Here's the second reason. Number two, because promises lead us in the right direction. Because a promise from God leads you in the right direction. I'll prove it to you right from Scripture. And we'll start off very simple. Let's, let's, we're going to repeat a verse that you either know from the Bible or church or maybe because you've seen an NFL football game. <laughs> John 3, 16, Right? Think about, let's, let's do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, here's the question. What is the promise there? The promise is this, that you'll have everlasting life. And where does that promise lead you? It leads you in the right direction of believing in Jesus Christ. Every promise in Scripture leads you in the direction for your life and the way you're supposed to go. Here's another example. This is in Luke chapter 6, and I'll start in verse 35. And Jesus is speaking. He says, but love your enemies. That's an easy one, isn't it? <laughs> Whew. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. I never have found that bank. That Scripture's never at the bottom of a bank logo. And watch, here comes the promise, your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. See, there is the promise and when you hear the promise, what direction does it lead you into? It leads you to be loving to your enemies, to do good, lend, hope for nothing in return. See, goes on to say, for he's kind to the un unthankful and evil, therefore be merciful just as your father also is merciful. And then uh, look at verse 27, watch, here we go again. Judge not and you will not be judged. There's the promise. What does it lead you to? It leads you in the direction of not judging. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Promise, direction. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Promise, direction. Look at this. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it will be poured into your bosom. Do you see? When you get a promise from God, it takes you somewhere that you're supposed to go in God. And see, it's so easy just to say, well, but I get my direction on a moment-by-moment -moment, moment basis from the Holy Spirit. Isn't it spiritual to receive daily direction, hourly direction, moment-by-moment -moment direction from the Holy Spirit of God? Yes, that is so great. That is absolutely part of who we are in God. We're to be guided by His Spirit. But listen to me. There, there is something in the mind of God that he wants you to understand a further distance down the road. He wants you to have a greater vision of where you're headed rather than just moment by moment. Because you understand, you can be guided moment by moment, but without a further destination, you're just wandering. You realize the children of Israel were guided in the wilderness for 40 years, ladies and gentlemen. And it says they wandered and there are Christians who live like this. They know what they're supposed to do today. They know what they weren't supposed to do yesterday. They're making those corrections, but they don't have an overall promise from God that says, this is where I'm taking you. And they feel like they're wandering. They feel like they're wandering. God doesn't want you to feel like you're wandering. God wants you to feel like you are stable in the path you're headed in. You know, a couple of years ago, my wife um, got me a GPS because we, we like to go camping as a family. We pull a really nice RV and we go camping. <laughs> My wife was like, I'm not sleeping on the ground, but I will camp if you'll buy me to that house that has wheels. <laughs> so my wife bought me this GPS so, because she would get lost. And, and so <clears throat> she wanted me to be able to get, get where we were going. So she bought me a GPS, but there's a problem with the GPS that she bought me. And it's this, it was manufactured in hell. <laughs> On the back, you look, it says made in Sheol. <laughs> I'm sure of it. You know why? Because it has a lying spirit.
I tried to cast it out, it didn't work. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's rotten to the core. And see the GPS, most of these GPSs, you know, they speak to you in a lady's voice. No, I'm not going there. I don't even believe that. But my kids named the voice Nancy. And I call it Nancy the liar. Because the, the, the thing doesn't work. It, now, now, don't get me wrong. It does work sometimes. There's just a few uh, incidents that will cause it to not work. Um, traffic, detours, construction, inclement weather, or any other circumstance. <laughs> Here's what I want you to get, though. If that GPS worked perfectly, if it never failed to tell me the right turn, the left turn, the U-turn, whatever it was, it would still be absolutely useless if I did not first enter in the destination. And it could tell me where to turn, it could tell me when to stop, it could give me all the directions it would ever need to, and I would still feel aimless in my walk. God wants you to have a destination. Promises will lead you in a direction and it will give you an overarching vision when God says, listen, I'm gonna bring that to pass. I'm promising this to you. That's the second reason. Here's the third reason. Number three, why God gives promises because promises demonstrate God's faithfulness. Because promises demonstrate God's faithfulness. Now, I'm going to read a few verses to you. They're going to bring them up, and um, I'm going to machine gun these kind of quickly, so you don't need to turn there, but if you want to, make a note. And I want you to notice something that these verses have in common. I think you're going to get the gist of this. I'll start in Isaiah 49, verse 23. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their knees, or with their, with their faces to the earth, and lick up the dust of your feet. Watch this statement. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Here's another example. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 38. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Zechariah chapter four, verse eight and nine. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Here's what God loves to do. He loves to make a promise in advance of something happening so that when it happens, you know it's him. Amen. See, that's what's so important. That's why God does it. You see, if God doesn't promise it in advance, well, I... I Maybe it's luck. Maybe it's Buddha. Aren't, there are people who thank Buddha when things happen. Maybe it's Muhammad. Maybe it's Krishna. Maybe it's karma. Maybe, maybe, maybe. How do you know for sure? Here's how you know for sure. Because you heard it in advance. Therefore, you're able to say, God, you did this. You did this. How do I know? Because you said it in advance. You promised it. And when it came to pass, now I know it's you. See, Jesus said the exact same things. Look at this, these are New Testament examples. John chapter two and verse 19. Jesus is there, you know, dueling with the Pharisees as usual. And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, watch, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. See, he told them in advance, it happened, and they knew he was faithful. Here's another example. And Jesus just sums it up here in John 13, 19. He says, now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. I told you in advance, and now it happens, and now you know I did it. You see, that is a great motive for God, but see, there's actually another underlying motive. See, what God wants is, he, when he demonstrates his faithfulness to you, he wants you to be able to look at that faithfulness and say this, you love me. 
You did this because you love me. And that there comes out of it a heart response that only he deserves. Not luck, not Buddha, not Christian, not anybody else. You know, my wife and I, around a certain holiday season that will remain nameless, choose to not incorporate a certain mythological character who will remain nameless. We choose to not incorporate that certain mythological character into this certain holiday season, and we don't do it for maybe the reason you think. Matter of fact, it's really not for a spiritual reason at all. We don't incorporate that mythological character into the holiday season for a really simple reason. Because I cannot fathom in my mind being dragged out of my bed at 5 a.m. or 5.30 before my first cup of coffee and brought in front of the seasonal decorative (laughs) and seeing this sight. My kids with certain belongings ripping those things open and saying something like this. Oh, look, it's exactly what I asked for. In fact, it's better than what I asked for. And not only that, but I got two of them. Oh my gosh, it's exactly what I'd hoped for. Thank you, mythological character who will remain nameless. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so grateful. You know why I could never, ever conceive of that? Because I bought those things. (laughs) And those things are a demonstration of my love, of my sacrifice, of my care of my heart, and I am not a more jealous father than God Almighty, and he will share his glory with no other. So how does it translate? It's very simple, it translates this way. God wants you to know that was me. That was me. What he does in your life, he wants you to know that was me. That wasn't this other, it was me. That's his heart. It demonstrates his faithfulness. And listen, it clears up a life that has a hard time worshiping him because when you live in the promises of God and you're seeing them fulfilled, the obvious response is, thank you. I mean, it no longer becomes hard to give him praise and to give him worship. That's number three. And finally, here's number four. The fourth reason why God gives promises. It's... Because promises encourage us during hard times. Now, if you've been saved less than 10 minutes, maybe you haven't figured out that getting born again does not eliminate your problems. (laughs) It doesn't. I'll tell you, if that's the gospel you were fed, you've been lied to, I'm sorry. That is not what is in this book. Matter of fact, sometimes when you get born again, your problems increase. But they're problems according to life, not according to death. You realize if you're born again, this is as bad as the world's ever gonna get. If you're not born again, this is as good as the world's ever gonna get. That's nothing to do with the message, okay? But you're gonna have hard times come whether you're born again or not. And we're not exempt from those things. And so Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy Uh, chapter 1, verse 18, and he's writing to, by the way, Paul's writing to Timothy, who's the senior pastor of the largest church in the world. He was the church of Ephesus. Some scholars believe that Ephesus was as big as 200,000 people. I have no concept of how many services they might have had. I think I get depressed thinking about it. It, That is a lot of people. The smallest estimate I've ever seen is 20,000 people there at Ephesus. And Timothy was the senior pastor, and he was, oh man, he was encountering people who were false prophets, false teachers, false uh, brethren, the Judaizers, all kinds of idol worship. He was combating all these things, and the enemy wanted him to basically just get so beat down, so discouraged that he finally quit. He had hard times. And so Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this to him in chapter 1, verse 18. He said, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. Now watch this carefully. According to the prophecies 
made concerning you. Now, what, is the, what do the prophecies mean? Well, you can, you can read that. That word could be promises. Why? How do I know that? Because what is a prophecy? A prophecy is a promise of something that God's going to do in the future. It's something that's exhortation, edification, and comfort. It's something that builds you up, calls you alongside, and comforts your heart. It's a promise from God. So he's saying, I'm exhorting you according to the, prof- the prophecies previously made concerning you that look, that by them, by what? By the promises, by the prophecies. By them, you what? You wage a good warfare. A warfare against who? A warfare against the devil who comes to attack you during hard times. And let me just let you in on a little secret. The devil is completely unoriginal. He always uses the same attack on every single believer during hard times. It's the same one and it works most often. That's why he uses it. It's discouragement. If during hard times the enemy can discourage you, he can talk you and beguile you out of everything else that's yours in Christ. He can take back ground that you took from him if he can just get you discouraged. And it's his number one attack. But here's what's amazing. What's amazing is how a fight changes once you get the right weapon in the right hand against the right enemy. It's amazing when you get a promise how you can deal with them. Many years ago when my wife and I had bought our first house, we had a starter home like many of you did. and uh, We had, I think, two. I think it was either two or three small children. And... um, you know, it was, it was a nice neighborhood we could afford, but it was still contained some questionable characters. And our home sat in a group of homes that formed a circle. And so my wife would take the kids. Yeah, we had two small ones and we had one in the uh, stroller still. And, and, and she would walk this loop. Now we had a questionable character that lived across the street from us and he had a pit bull terrier. Okay, now I love dogs. Let me just go on record. I love dogs. I believe that there will be dogs in heaven, which is my theological basis that there will be no cats. (laughs) As Paul would say, that's me, not the Lord. I I love dogs, but I hated this dog because this dog, this dog was evil and mean, and it was held in the backyard with one of those four-foot chain-link fences, which is an absolute joke. It's basically a warm-up, a mime of a barrier for the dog to just warm up on before he goes and terrorizes your family. And it was Sunday, this is about the mid 90s. A cowboy game was on, mid 90s Cowboys. I was probably napping. And so, <clears throat> I'm taking a nap and I hear my wife out in the front yard and she's screaming. I hear her screaming my name. Steven, Steven, Steven. I hear a dog barking, so I jump up and I run to the window, and there is that dog, and it is coming across the street, and it has her backed up to the mailbox. She's got her hands like this, and she is trying to be brave, talking that dog. She's got the kids behind her and one in the stroller, and here's that pit bull. So I do what any of you husbands would do. I bolt out the door, I run across the lawn, and throw my body in between my beloved wife and kids and those jaws. And I'm doing my best. And I'm trying to be strong, I'm trying to be tough, and I'm talking to that dog with authority, and I'm, I'm using all my, you know, all the rasp I get, kind of like people do when they talk to the devil. Listen, Mr. Devil. <laughs> and the dog is not buying it. He's getting more bold, he's getting more brazen. I can tell he's figuring out that he can latch on to me and probably take me. But I said four words to my wife, that changed the entire circumstance. Kelly, get my gun. You say, oh, was the pastor gonna shoot the dog? Yes, I was going to shoot the dog. So Kelly runs and goes and gets my pistol. And I am there and the dog's getting more bold, more bold, more bold. And we're going through kind of this dance until I feel Kelly coming up behind me and I stick out my hand and she lays that 45 in my hand. I don't, the dog just like knew. <laughs> I don't understand it. I'm telling you, I don't understand it. I, I, didn't, I didn't even get time to point the gun. As soon as it hit my hand, something changed. It's like he had some ESPN or something, you know? I, <laughs> As soon as it hit my hand, his ears pin back, his tail goes under it, and I can't even get the gun around. He takes off and he makes it back over the fence. 
See, here's, here's what I'm gonna say to you. It's, it's amazing what happens when you get the right weapon in the right hand against the right enemy. You don't even necessarily have to shoot it. Because that's what this is designed to do. That's what Jesus did when he dealt with the accuser. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He constantly fought with this. He constantly fought with the promises of who God was and what God had already said, and it's always enough. And see, what's wonderful about knowing why God wants to do that is aside from the awesome benefits that we get in hearing his promises, what we begin to realize is the promises are given there not just to give us a benefit, but to call us into a deeper communion and to walk closely with him and to know him, to know his heart, not just his what, but really his why. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you just to ask what we ask many, many times each weekend at Gateway Church. Right there where you are, will you just whisper a simple prayer? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me? Could be you need encouragement. Could be you need guidance. Could be you lack faith. Whatever the thing is that God's promises will meet, He's a good Father and He wants to give them. So I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. And if you'd like, you can pray this with me Heavenly Father, thank you for your promises. I need them. And I'm asking you to let me hear one. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we wanna do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I wanna encourage you to sign up for this class because we wanna help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I'm so proud of you.